Hello and welcome to the Kent Voices podcast with me, your host, Charlie Gurr. As part of the University of Kent and Kent Union celebration of UK Disability History Month from 18th of November to 18th of December 2021, staff contributed to a panel to discuss one of this year's national themes, Hidden Impairments. So, without further ado, I'll hand over to Becky. So, welcome everybody to this podcast for um, Disability History Month um, at the University of Kent in 2021. Um, This is a panel podcast um, involving some of our wonderful alumni students, uh, Demi, Natalie and Xenia, and one of our careers staff members, Hannah. These people have all volunteered to join this panel discussion just to talk about their own experiences um, living and studying and working with various hidden impairments and just have a chat about those experiences, offer any tips and advice to our current students about how they've found um, both studying and then applying for jobs in the future um, and just generally talk about about life. So with that, I would like to hand over to our fantastic panel to, to just to start the conversation going a bit. So I'm, I'm Demi for the people listening so that you know whose voice is whose. I have struggled with hidden disabilities uh, for most of my life. Um, I have a few various conditions, some of them being physical. So I have a a hypermobility spectrum disorder, which can result in frequent uh, joint dislocations uh, without any given warning, which is (laughs) really nice. Um, And that also causes kind of general joint pain and fatigue. And I have to be very careful with uh, any exercise that I choose to do, things like that. Um, I also have fibromyalgia, which is a widespread uh, pain condition. Um, they I'm still not really too sure what causes fibromyalgia. That's still up for debate. Um, but it's just general kind of widespread pain all of the time. The best way that I can describe it is a bit like the day that you've gone a little bit too overboard in the gym and you wake up the next morning feeling really super sore and achy and that's pretty much what it's like standard all of the time and that comes with kind of fibro fog and some kind of issues of cognition and memory and being able to retrieve memories um, and I also have depression and a general anxiety disorder as well so a whole heap of uh, experiences to draw on in this podcast. I'm happy to go next. So I'm Natalie. Yeah, it feels like a lifetime ago that I graduated from Kent, but really it was only in 2019. Um, and yeah, I think for myself in terms of like my hidden disability or impairment, however you want to kind of term it, I have depression and anxiety. So, um, I would say a lot of people who don't know me would often say that I, don't come across as as I have depression and anxiety they would have never really known that if they didn't know me um because I can come across quite bubbly um really outgoing sometimes but there are times where yeah I'm not okay and um my depression and anxiety is something that I I struggle with so yeah uh I'm Xenia graduated in 2019 as well and I have I won the genetic lottery for uh, various ailments the main one I guess is Ellis Danlos syndrome which is a connective tissue disorder but it also affects everything else in the body like your organs and your skin people with Ellis Danlos tend to more have like things like IBS as well because it affects everything and then I've got fibromyalgia pain syndrome as Demi said and got a skin condition which I won't go too much into because it's not great and I also have depression anxiety as well and I'm currently being is the word investigate I'm looking for for a dissociative disorder as well so I just won the lottery with that one (laughs) but that's uh that's that's what I've got going on thank you for sharing Xenia uh Hannah are you okay to wrap up yeah absolutely um, I don't want to feel like it t- trumps, you know, we're, we're sort of, um, <laughs> but, you know, against each other and who's, who's going to win. But um, I also uh, have a chronic pain condition. Um, I thought it was fibromyalgia for a very long time. And then when I was 32, I was diagnosed with um, something called Mercado disease, which is a really rare genetic condition um, where my muscles, upon very little pressure you know I'm not a sporty person on very little kind of ac- exertion and activity um they try to break down so I can't use sugar basically as an energy source 
Um, I can't use glucose, so my muscles instead try to break down. So I get a lot of cramping. Um, it can, because your muscles are breaking down, it can affect your kidneys as well. So you have to be really careful um, if you are, you know, exerting yourself in any way, um, that you're kind of drinking lots of water and keeping everything flowing, basically. So um, I have that, which, as I said, I wasn't diagnosed until I was 32. So for a, a lot of years, was unsure kind of what was going on and what was wrong with me. Um, and whilst I was at university, I didn't have any idea that any of that was going on. Um, I also have depression and anxiety. And um, I was then lucky enough to get the um, get thyroid cancer in 2013. So I'd have my thyroid removed, which then adds to the fatigue and um, lots of the other fun that you get with the kind of fibromyalgia and pain conditions as well of like lack of healing and, and stuff like that. So um, and also have mobility. So, you know, kind of understand a, a bit around what others are, have been going through. But definitely my experience is very much post university and more because I was a Kent graduate. I'm a Kent graduate as well myself. But um, as a staff member, I've kind of been negotiating it a bit more than I, when I was studying, really. Do you feel that um, the kind of the physical hidden impairment symptoms that you all experience plays a part in things like depression and anxiety and things like that, and that there's a direct link between them? Definitely. Yeah, 100%. Because yeah. when yeah. it comes to me specifically, um, because I don't have much connective tissue in my joints, they just slip apart, and so sometimes, for instance, I can't cut up my own food, and it's just like, oh, I can't do this in quotation marks, normal thing, and it's just a circle of that. Absolutely, and, and for me, with mobility-wise, I need to, if someone says, let's go and meet for a coffee, my immediate thought is, are they going to want to walk with me? Will they be going faster than me? And therefore, I'm kind of, you know, I, I get to a, p a point at which my muscles are in so much pain or they might go into spasm in, in a situation that to some seems so you know such a simple thing to do kind of walk a slight incline or using a spray bottle my hands will seize up that kind of thing um but also the kind of the so the overthinking of you know well will I be able to sit down when I get there or like what will the seat be like if I sit uncomfortably will I pull a muscle or um if I go to lift my coffee and I've got a bag you know this kind of overthinking and anxiety is, is kind of constantly there um and like it, it's given me huge strength in that I'm great at planning. I'm really organised, but actually on a daily basis, it's because my brain is constantly going, you know, <laughs> kind of how do I work this out or how do I get there and back again without doing myself an injury? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think something which I uh, forgot to mention at the beginning as well when we were doing introductions is that I've really recently been diagnosed with ADHD, a uh, combination type, and that was about two or three months ago now. Um, and I think that lack of diagnosis and kind of guidance really, really sent my anxiety into overdrive because there was just a constant sense of overwhelm, of uh, uh, feeling as though I'm not doing things in the same way that like my peers do. Instead of going from A to B, I would go like jump from A to Z to S to R to get back to B and could never really seem to find mental shortcuts. Um, had real struggle kind of paying attention and concentrating on tasks um, and all of that and it's, especially in social situations as well kind of keeping track of conversations going on socially being able to give people my full attention is actually really quite difficult um, so I think a lot of that ended up because I didn't have that diagnosis and therefore no clear understanding of why I was struggling with that stuff ended up with just being this massive ball of anxiety of knowing that stuff isn't quite right, but not being able to figure out how to fix it. Um, and so I must say, when I got my diagnosis a couple of months ago, that was a real weight off my shoulders because it was like, oh, OK, this makes sense now. It's not just that. I can't do these things because I'm not disciplined enough or I'm a bit lazy or, you know, all of that kind of stigma that tends to come along with it. It's actually like, oh, yeah, no, there, there is a reason for this. And in the same, like, I really relate to what Hannah's saying as well when they said that, um, you know, when someone asks you to go somewhere or go on a day out, one day I might be completely fine, but then the next day I can, like, barely walk or get out of bed mm -hmm. or I may have dislocated a joint and all of this stuff. So all of the anxieties around how am I going to get there, how am I going to get back, 
if I'm going to the pub with mates, I can't stand up all night and I don't want to be that person that's constantly buzzing around looking for a chair to sit down in or being the only one in a chair and separated from my group and all of that sort of stuff really really does play in I think to the kind of mental health side of the conditions. Definitely I completely agree with that and then the realising there is a free chair and realising I can't lift that chair um, <laughs> goes into that yeah. cycle of oh I need someone to help me you know, whereas actually it's we should, like society should look at it from the other way of like, how can we help everyone? But actually it does end up being the disabled person who's like, oh, I need this. Can you do so and so? And it, it's tiring, isn't it, really? You know, and I think that's where depression can link into it as well. You kind of reflect on stuff afterwards and think, oh, you know, I had to sit over there away from everyone, like you said, or, you know, oh, my friends wanted to do paintball for their birthday. I can't do that, you know, that kind of thing. Um, it's like, it, I almost feel like sometimes, I always say to my friends, keep asking me, <laughs> keep asking me, like there'll be something I can do, you know, <laughs> or just, and a lot of them are really good at it. Like they'll say, oh, we've, um, we brought you this like um, camping chair because we knew that we were going to so-and-so. And, and it's just really nice when that does happen. But sometimes it will be, you're having, I don't know, a barbecue on the beach or, you know, something. It's just like, there's so many logistics around that that I just don't it's easier for me to go don't worry I'll I'll see you next time and and it's hard because you miss out and people probably feel that you're just making an excuse when actually just exhausted already (laughs) before you do it does this kind of also explain or not explain that's the wrong word but emphasize why it's so important to have that support network of really good friends family etc around you who understand what your, your your needs are and can make those adjustments and you know you're talking about you know going down to the pub etc and then just automatically going to find a table which everyone can sit around rather than choosing to stand and have a drink at the bar for example and how have you found finding those groups of friends and kind of falling into those type of relationships i think for me i after the thyroid cancer kind of happened um everyone may have this assumption that oh so you've had your operations, you've had whatever treatment, you know, I had, I had radiotherapy, um, you're better now. When actually something like having no thyroid is a chronic condition in itself. You know, I get free medication because I have to be on it for life. Um, and actually, we were lucky to find out afterwards that my body doesn't respond to the medication that they put you on. So I have to take an additional medication to make sure that it does work. And just kind of all these additional things. And I had a friend at the time who... I don't think has ever had a consideration around anxiety or depression or indeed any kind of physical impairment. And she said, oh, I've booked us a yoga session. Um, Get all your your gym clothes, as if I've got gym clothes. Get your gym clothes ready and we're going to go to so-and-so. And And I'm like, by the time I get to the gym, I'll be exhausted. (laughs) You know, (laughs) I can't get on a bus to get there because of where it is. All of these sorts of thoughts. And then I'm thinking, I have to go and buy gym clothes. And then I just burst into tears in front of my partner and, and they were like, well, why are you, why did you say yes? Or why are you kind of going ahead and doing it? And I was like, well, she's trying to include me. But then you start to think, well, she's trying to include me in her life, not in a way that's accessible to me. So instead of saying, I'll come round to you and bring you some dinner, which actually, fine, yes, that we can do. You know, I know my house is safe. I can move around. I can lie down if I need to. If you're expecting me to go on this <laughs> grand adventure that might not be a grand adventure to some people, um, that's a massive ask, really. And I think, sadly, some people fall by the wayside and it is a shame. And hopefully they will kind of make better choices maybe in future or, or kind of understand from situations like that, that that you do need to consider you're less mobile or, or kind of less, you know, even with anxiety and depression cancelling last minute kind of saying, it's too much sort of thing and and the the friends that understand that and the family and all of that are the ones that you continue to see you know I think I definitely agree with a lot of what Hannah said I think with all of you guys like just to touch on something as well that you guys said before that I thought about um I I don't have like I suppose a physical health condition that I would say massively kind of like impairs my life or is something that I have to manage daily like I have asthma but it's not something that I I see as kind of chronic or anything like that um but for you guys especially like myself if I think like when 
I'm down or when I am really going through periods where I'm really anxious like how hard that is and just the mental thought process and just trying to, it, it's, it's draining and I can imagine I think having physical health conditions pain conditions and stuff like that that added impact of that on your mental health with an existing like mental health condition that that must be really hard like and sometimes you're like I'm not I'm not okay like I can't do it today and stuff like that I fully I suppose like I can't relate but I hear you guys in terms of that I think for myself like I agree with a lot of what Hannah said I think sometimes it's just about certain friends loved ones and things like that it just has to be it should be that society should be adapting to things it shouldn't be that the person that has a disability or impairment is trying to adapt to fit into somewhere where really it's not working um but I think for myself with friends and stuff like that something I struggled with um I suppose earlier on into understanding like my depression anxiety like I really had that whether it was stigma or other influences or whatever it was I feel like I had to like push myself to go to plans and push myself to do things when really my anxiety was saying no, you're not okay like and I would try because I'd be like well then they're gonna see me as this and because for myself I can be quite a bubbly person or, or outgoing so it's it's a stark difference when I'm not like that so I think for me I really did struggle with that and I didn't want to let people down and I think when I was at uni actually um I think there was a point where yeah I was just really not okay and I think that I just started cancelling stuff just not attending things not going to things and stuff like that and some of my friends like from home didn't understand like some of my friends were meaning because they could see what was happening and also some which were very understanding Demi which is one of them on the call um but yeah like I think other people couldn't see that and they just didn't understand and they would get frustrated and they just would like exclude me out of things and that was hard like it was hard to realize that um but also for myself and I I recognize it's not easy to do and it's definitely a process but I am very open and honest now I think about my mental health I think with friends I'll be like I am just feeling anxious today I can't do it like and if they don't want to understand that they don't want to understand that I don't need that in my life like I need someone that is going to be try try to be understanding and just help me work through it or just give me the space if I need space to process that so I think in my life now definitely much more understanding people and people that care but it can be hard it can be really hard. Do you think that there's a greater increase in awareness of mental health conditions and more understanding about that compared to a few years ago. There have been so many national campaigns and localised uh, stuff going on at universities, for example. You've got things like World Mental Health Day for now, Universities Mental Health Day, etc. Does all of that make a difference and is it still important to have all of that? I think I think it's definitely made a dent in, in some areas. I wouldn't say that it's had an overall massively significant impact and I think it also depends on kind of what mental health conditions you're talking about or you're referring to so we've become more comfortable as a society to talk about depression and anxiety I think than when we talk about more uh, in quotation marks serious mental health conditions such as schizophrenia personality disorders and things like that that is still very very taboo there's lots of stigma and stereotypes that still exist and we're not comfortable to have those conversations yet at all. But I think the kind of the, the national campaigns and the things that have been going on definitely are moving us in the right direction slowly but surely. But that is to be expected when we've existed in a certain way in Western society for a millennia. We're not going to change this after a couple of years of having time to talk like that's it's it's not realistic. Um and that's also OK. I think that's the thing that I really look at and kind of going back to the previous question around friendships. If my friends don't have a disability or they don't understand my conditions and they don't always get it right, that's fine. Like, I'm not going to be angry at sometimes people missing the mark if I can see that my friends are continuously trying to be there for me in the way that I need then that's enough. Like we live and we learn and we make mistakes and we can have like I have enough love and trust in my friends that if they've done something that isn't accessible to me or has made me feel a certain type of way that I can say, hey, actually, this didn't really work out for me uh, because of this reason. So next time, could we try doing something like this instead? And that's that's enough. And I think that that sometimes it's that fear of having the conversation that stops people from 
being supportive, not because they don't have the intentions to be supportive, but they're so paralysed by fear of what if I say the wrong thing? What if I do the wrong thing? And I think this relates to a lot of societal issues we have outside of disability as well. But that's a conversation uh, for another time that nothing happens. We just get stuck in this state of not moving because what if I do it wrong? Yeah, but also what if you do it right? And what if you learn something from doing it wrong? And I think that that's kind of where these conversations need to get to as well, not just around talking about mental health and, you know, having that sort of happy, clappy side of sitting down and having a coffee and having a chat. But also when you get it wrong, where where do I go from here? I don't think that conversation has quite been approached in the same level of detail yet. It keeps the conversation open, doesn't it? Mm. It sort of invites people to talk about it. I think... One thing that I've noticed is uh, um, you mentioned it about the kind of Western perspective and kind of living in in the Western society. There's so many differences around um, kind of response to disability, mental health, that kind of thing across the world and generationally as well. I don't know if you've kind of encountered this. You know, I've certainly spoken to people who say things like, oh, everyone's got something now, you know, or or kind of a, a sort of, you know, oh, this is this new thing you know, this new thing, everyone's got anxiety. And it, it's quite interesting, really, when actually what, like what you were saying, Demi, you know, it's about keeping that conversation open and kind of going, well, if, if you don't understand what this is, ask someone or do a bit of research, you know, not kind of saying you, someone, you know, a friend or a family member has to do a PhD in your, you know, whatever your impairment is. But actually, you know, friends of mine who've said, oh, I looked looked up so-and-so and and it was really interesting to read this and I noticed that when you do this, it's probably that. And I'm like, yes, (laughs) you know, I felt really, like, supported in that way. And I think that's that's exactly it. It's about opening those conversations. But also, I do feel a little that sometimes it's a double-edged sword that we, as disabled people, end up being the advocate for ourselves, which in itself is exhausting. I had a conversation about wearing masks and saying about, you know, even in like student appointments and things like that and um someone had said you know if someone had a disability and they wanted me to wear a mask of course I would and I said but how do you know that person has a disability unless they tell you and at that point they're saying would you mind wearing a mask please I'm clinically extremely vulnerable and it was and you know the person that said this was doing it with such openness and kindness of course I would you know I'd have no issue but it's just it's almost a, a step before that isn't it kind of going what can I do without getting this person to have to say no this is what I need if that makes sense but yeah I think sometimes we end up being an advocate which is important as well you know I I run sessions in the careers and employability service on um, asking for reasonable adjustments um, talking about your disability with confidence finding inclusive employers those sorts of things and it is important to talk positively enthusiastically about these are the things I can do this is what I need to be able to do my job you know, and it's just a, a kind of ingraining that into your your kind of mindset. Like Natalie said about being open. I mean, I, I tell everyone these things, you know, <laughs> I'll chew anyone's ear off about um, disability at any any given moment. But um, I think it's just really important to kind of give people the chance to understand and, and listen. I think the idea of fear about it, fear of getting it wrong, fear of not knowing what to say or fear of causing embarrassment or asking somebody to go over something which they've probably gone over a million times before in their lives it is probably quite a big factor as to why these conversations aren't that open at the moment from from your perspective how do you think people can overcome that fear of offending their friends or their loved ones who are living with various conditions i think um as like both hannah and demi said like opening the conversation people feeling comfortable like not getting it and like Demi said I think it's with a lot of issues in society I think you have to have an open conversation and someone to be like listen look like I'm struggling to understand this um or like I want to have a conversation about this will you tell me because I think with I can speak for myself but I think actually no to be fair for a lot of disabilities It manifests in different ways for different people. So, yes, you can read up stuff and people should. I do think that um, if you have someone in your life that you love and that you care about, you should be willing to be like, okay, I actually am going to research this. I'm not just going to expect them to tell me everything. But at the same time, everyone is different. So what you read online 
might not manifest for for a different person or there might be symptoms that aren't even like discovered yet that aren't online that people don't know about and asking that person like what would help for you like what what can I do to make it easier for you or like for example if we go out like the same way you I'm not trying to compare it but the same way people ask let's say if someone is vegan if I have a friend that's vegan I will consider okay well I need to look at restaurants that I know have options because if they don't have that that's that's not going to be a great experience for them they'll probably be able to have water and nothing else like so it's about considering okay cool so what things will help you like when we're out if I notice that you feel anxious like what can help you if that makes sense or if I notice you've not really spoken to me for a while and stuff like I'll check in and checking in might be having a conversation it might not be having a conversation it might be distracting themselves it might be like let's just go for a walk or if you don't want to go outside because you feel too anxious to leave the house like what other things can we do so it's about people coming forward and asking I think yeah in society there's just we can't keep continuing to be scared to ask the more we do that the worse it's going to get really um for people who have disabilities and stuff like that and just about not being afraid if you care about someone and they care about you and you know what your relationship is being like okay well I'm just going to be brave and I'm going to ask them and I, I would expect that because they love me and they care about me I'll get a response that we can see if we can have conversation and also not being scared about conflict or when like Dem- Demi said like not getting it wrong if someone will trusting that someone will tell you okay that did offend me a little bit or that's not okay to say or that's not okay to do and stuff like that and just kind of learning from there so yeah to uh add on to what natalie said it is mostly about trial and error especially with people you have some sort of relationship friendship or whatever because if you if someone does ask you a i don't know an offensive question if you're a loved one of theirs surely everyone involved can go "Mm, don't like that or yeah i can answer that and then eventually it's just you find the spot where you can just ask without having to worry it's just trial and error there's um i think it was hannah who mentioned about you know what the latest in inverted commas trendy impairment is and a lot of this seems to be driven by you know so-called influencer culture um people who are either been genuinely living with various impairments and are now shining a spotlight on it but you also hear stories as well about some people who want to say that they have an impairment without necessarily um, having a full diagnosis or living with that impairment um, because they think it might either in, in, you know, engage more audiences or something. And I can see it having you know, both negatives and benefits in terms of raising awareness but also in, in some ways of trivialising impairments to some degree. Um, I don't know if or not you've got any thoughts or opinions on kind of influencer culture and impairments and, and that cross-section. Absolutely. I suppose the first thing that I really want to bring in there is around um, I don't think people should always feel the need to have a professional diagnosis to say that they're living with an impairment because there are lots of biases in the medical world that certain people are over or under diagnosed with different conditions. For example, with myself having ADHD, all of the research was done on young boys. All of the research around the characteristics, the symptoms, the traits, the treatment, everything was done on, on, young, on young boys. So now being a 25 year old woman come in to try and get a diagnosis when the criteria for that diagnosis is not made for someone like me then that's going to be much harder in the same way that we tend to over diagnose black men with serious mental health conditions without looking at kind of a wider research base. And so it's just there are lots of people who know for sure this is a condition that I have, but medical professionals are not listening to me because the diagnostic criteria was not made to suit me and my community. And so I don't think that we are kind of trivialising these conditions by either over-diagnosing them or self-declaring diagnosis at all. I think actually what we're realising is all of us are kind of divergent in some way, like the majority of us have something going on. Uh, and that's not because as Hannah alluded to it like oh times are changing and everyone's got something now and yeah because the world is safer more generally speaking not for everyone but 
uh, kind of, yeah, on a general level, it's safer for people to say now that they have these conditions. There are laws in place to protect these people now that didn't exist years ago. And uh, as, as that pertains to influencer culture, I think what's happening is actually a really positive thing. Um, and I think that the cases of people saying falsely declaring that they have some sort of diagnosis to gain more media traction is very, very rare. Um, but there are often a lot of mainstream uh, kind of think pieces into this area that would suggest otherwise. And that is kind of a trend in and of itself uh, to combat uh, people getting the support and help that they need for the diagnoses that they have. I thoroughly agree. Um, and I think there's a lot of medical trauma if you've been through quite a lot of your life. Um, or even any of your life, not getting a diagnosis or not understanding why these things are happening to you um, or being pushed back and told, you know, in my case, um, oh, you need to lose weight, you need to exercise. So I pushed myself to the point of the kidney issues because my muscles are breaking down, you know, those sorts of things. And it's like this, this circle. And um, it was only when I had the thyroid cancer diagnosis and nothing was working, I didn't feel any better, I wasn't magically losing weight as they thought I would. This was when we found, I found, which is ridiculous, um, the, this really rare disease, which so few people are diagnosed with. And they said, Prob it's probably not that, we'll refer you and see what happens. DNA test six months later, you've got this uh, gene, um, two mutated genes, in fact, um, which gives you this condition. And it's like, well, why did I have to find that out? I've got a degree in French, you know, that's, that's, not, that's not my specialism. Um, so it, it, is, it is quite traumatic to keep going and saying, I think I've got a new condition that I need, you know, support with, or this is a thing. And, and, and I do think you kind of, you end up self-diagnosing or going, actually, I think, you know, I've got that in some way, but is it just something to add to a list or who am I needing to prove it to? It's kind of getting that, um, either a group of people that understand you so like on social media you know you might see other people that have that condition and you go oh these are my people you know I understand this situation um, I was saying about the think piece Demi the, that you're talking about I was reading something the other day about how um, there's apparently an increase in Tourette's and tic like tics tic disorders and Tourette's when actually it's just that more people are speaking up and saying I live with this it doesn't mean I am you know the stereotype of um someone with Tourette the, the, from the documentaries back in the day where it was a man walking along shouting you know or screaming or swearing and actually there's many different manifestations of Tourette's and tic disorders and more and more people are just saying yeah I have an element of that or I have this element of that so I think it's a really good thing um to bring that out and it is about finding that comfort you know being able to to sort of talk about it with an element of being comfortable about it and going back to advocating for yourself you know saying confidently this is what I have or even this is what I need just to echo basically what you guys have have all said I think like the more and more you learn and understand about yourself and about the world and as we progress I think that yeah, everyone is struggling with different things, like whether it's a full blown diagnosis, whether you are struggling and you are feeling. I think there's a difference, actually, to say with using certain terms. I think sometimes there are terms that are used, like people saying, oh, I've got depression, I've got anxiety. Yes, you probably do like feel low or have low periods and stuff, but that is different from like a full blown diagnosis um, and stuff like that, or just even words that are used like oh, I'm triggered by things and it's like for some people the meaning of that word triggered actually it has a lot rather than just something's annoyed you or something like that that's just not the same um but at the same time I think what Demi touched on as well like it's sometimes it's like climbing over like a mountain doing a triathlon a marathon and everything just to get a diagnosis uh especially within the NHS I feel um it can be so hard um and stuff and having to push for that and then feeling the way that you do and also I think with diagnosis things change so like Demi said like research changes we don't know what research is going to say in 30 years time if that makes sense the benchmark is always changing so I think that if people are struggling with something like first step it's it's a big step to be like I'm not okay something's going on here and I think 
that is a good thing. So when we see that, I think within influencer culture, um, and I'd say in relation to mental health, I think people being open and honest and saying, actually, yeah, there's been a period where I'm struggling or guys, today I'm not okay. Like it allows people to feel like, okay, like maybe it's okay to just talk about it. We're all human. We all experience things. Obviously there are differences between certain conditions, having a disability versus feeling the way they do. But I think it does, if anything, open up a conversation and then you're just able to learn more about it and then think, okay, maybe I feel, maybe I will try and approach my GP or maybe I'll speak to someone about their experience and consider what I want to do based on that. So, yeah. Moving on the conversation ever so slightly, um, do you want to have a bit of a chat about kind of any coping mechanisms and strategies that you've developed during the course of your life, but particularly in relation to academic studies and your academic work that could be of benefit to any students who are listening in? So I'll go, mine was a very long time ago um, when I was at university, you know, in the early 2000s, which is probably only some of you were only just born, but um, which is crazy to think. But um, when I was at university, I very much didn't cope with it very well. Um, You know, I didn't understand that I clearly had depression and anxiety, um, which a lot of the pain condition had kind of um, compounded almost. You know, you, you're told on a Monday morning at 9 a.m. you have a, um, a lecture in Darwin Tower Room, which now I think was a lift, um, but there never was. And it was about five or six flights of stairs. You know, it was ridiculous. So having to get up at a crazy time, to get there to be able to do a flight and then just pretend I had to do my shoe up or you know take a little pause for some reason or, or whatever because I can do basically in my condition I can do six seconds of exertion um, and then I have to wait a bit for kind of my energy to, to go back in otherwise I can go into spasm so it seems a bit odd when you're suddenly stopping and just oh we're just standing in this corridor but you know I, I didn't know why that was and um did go to the doctor and did do all of that but I you know my the things that I would say is to to get the support that is on offer you know the university has amazing support services um be that the kind of nursing type service if there's a, a situation that you need immediate assistance of any kind um talking to people like the security who are you know very kind and, and supportive and kind of wonder why you're standing having a muscle spasm in you know in the hall of Rutherford in the middle of the night and are you okay and you know um but all the way to to student support and well-being and and making sure you're checking in with your GP and things like that is is really important um but I didn't use the services as well as I could have done I think in those days I know Becky was around at a similar time to me there wasn't as much publicity we didn't have social media who can imagine you know (laughs) you had to queue up to get into a computer room so you could check your email like once a day um you know it was a it was a different time but I think hopefully nowadays there's a lot more that's done that that students can access like um study support as well you know the kind of planning tools and kind of understanding your strengths and 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 what you should be doing I think for me that that kind of it, it wasn't ideal the situation that I was kind of going through because my diagnosis main diagnosis was a lot later in life but I like to think that it's given me resilience and compassion for others in a similar situation and certainly really informs my job Um, so I support students from a wide range of backgrounds but disability is one of those and and actually it it makes it very personal to me because I've been in in that person's shoes basically I know, honey, you say it was a while ago, but I probably had a similar experience, to be fair. Obviously, there were more services that are available and stuff like that. Um, But I think, yeah, in my second year, um, yeah, I was struggling. I think I was struggling um, a lot. And just for me, I wasn't really talking about it and I wasn't speaking. I just kind of hid away um, and found that was the quote unquote. It's the way I coped at the time, but maybe not the best way to do so. Um, but I think I did a year. So I after that, I did a year out um, on placement in London where I live. And then I came back um, fourth year. And I think me kind of reflecting and realising and being more open about things. I went, I never like got um, reasonable adjustments or anything like that um, at the time. And in fourth year um, or final year, I yeah, I was like, I need to 
talk about this stuff like I need to talk about I need to get stuff put in place like it's important to do that if it will help me um so I did yeah speak to student well-being I did get like counseling and stuff like that I, I was able to talk through that um and stuff and also um I started taking medication that helped me for a period of time um yeah I would just get so if it was like extra time for example so I'd get really anxious and just overwhelmed and stuff in exams and for me to have that extra like 25 minutes or 25 percent whatever it is like was really helpful for me to just calm down to just collect my thoughts like and just try the best that I could um and stuff like that that stuff really helped me but I think reflecting now like doing the job that I do now and like supporting supporting others and people who are like victims of crime and stuff like that and my own well considering my own well-being whilst doing that I think like something I would do again if I could do uni over again is really I think when people go to uni like you can just be in a bubble and you can just think that like your studies and assignments and deadlines and stuff are like the only things like and there's just so much pressure with that but I think what I would do is just do more things for my well-being making sure I'm making time for myself like if I need whether that's getting support whether that's doing more things with friends doing more things on my with myself like I think for me like I know it's really simple but just going for walks and stuff really just helped stop my thought process or sometimes even just like working out after work straight away would just help like stop my thought process and obviously that doesn't solve everything and stuff like that but just doing more and more things and having that routine was really important when I feel at uni like assignments and stuff like that just consumed me and doing that and I think it's just important to have that and and yeah reach out if you can even if you don't feel able to start by reaching out to student services first and foremost or tutor just whoever you feel like you trust even if it's just friends or other people and just say do you know what I, I think I'm not okay like I'm I'm not sure what to do and just kind of going from there I I think the some of the staff that I spoke to and staff and like even Hannah like yeah were really supportive so I think it's important having those spaces to start that journey of whatever works for you really so yeah to uh, add on to that it's also worth talking to your department student support as well in the um, Department of Arts, we had Jackie Double, and she is literally amazing. Like, she knew I was struggling. She was like, what do you need? And I'm like, well, I can't do this or this. And she's like, I'll have a word with the people in charge. I might be able to get them to do this for you. And I'm like, oh, okay, that's amazing. And she let me get, like, extensions on my assignments and library rentals and stuff which it, it's very useful is just talking to your student support so you can put a plan in place if you need it. Yeah. Um, one of the best things I've ever done for my own well-being is to learn the art of self-advocacy. Um, and unfortunately, the way that the world is set up, as a disabled person, you are going to have to be the person fighting your own battle a lot of the time and demanding your own rights and stamping your own feet and that is the way that it works and so as long as that is the case you can never value enough learning how to self-advocate and it's a real skill and it's a talent and it's something that you have to practice um and something that I really worked on was finding the people in my life whether that was professionally or personally who are really good at that and saying can you teach me how to do that um so for me I was quite lucky in the fact that my mum is also a disabled person and she'd grown up um you know fighting for her own rights and uh you know there was a lot of uh different laws and stuff when uh when when she when she was around when she was growing up so um I actually sat down with her one day and said can you teach me how to do this and can you teach me how not to take no for an answer um because that's what you need and if you are asking for a reasonable adjustment and you get knocked back know what to do next don't just be like, oh, well, they said that they can't do it. So I guess I'm not going to have it because that isn't going to cut it and that ain't going to help you. So you need to know where to take that next, who you can rely on for support, who else can back your corner, um, what letters you need to write, what emails you need to make, what demands you like all of this stuff. And you do just have to build that kind of resilience to just keep going at it until you get what you deserve and what you need. Um, so, yeah, I think 
taken time to learn self-advocacy. And if you don't happen to know anyone in your professional, personal life, take it to Google, take it to a disability rights charity, ask them for their for, for their support to help you master this skill. And once you know it, you can take that through your studies, you can take that through your career, and it'll be something that will really, really stick with you and it will always be useful. Um, so that's probably my number one tip. And I think just to add from what Demi said, like if there are any people that happen to be listening and stuff that find that hard to do, I think it's something like Demi said, you have to learn, like you have to learn to also like just stand strong in the fact that this is your disability, this is your experience, this is what's happening to you and you're going to fight for that because you deserve that, like if that makes sense, to hold that strong and just to try your best and lean on people for support like Demi said it's not easy I've had my own experiences where I've tried to claim reasonable adjustments and stuff and it's it's gone completely the opposite to what I thought from what they said what the process would be versus what it actually was like I'm um, not um at uni at Kent uni just outside of that um but yeah and I think for me like being able to lean on other people and be like I need to speak about this or to call people for advice and to get that advice and to be able to advocate for myself was important so don't feel like you have to be there if that makes sense you have to be at that point and you have to be able to do that very well at the start but I think just being able to stand strong in that fact that you deserve society should not it should not be you adapting to society society should adapt to you um and yeah just holding that that strong and hopefully in the future there will be change and that will be the case but if until then to kind of just keep on fighting for that so yeah definitely uh, so just to add one more bit onto that Get it out of your head that what you're asking for is giving you an unfair advantage because it isn't. It's giving you a level playing field as to what everybody else gets. So if you have uh, anxiety and you need extra time in your exams because that's a way for you to control your anxiety and actually get through the exam. Remember, people that don't have anxiety are not experiencing those same feelings you are in the exam hall. It's not giving you an unfair advantage. And that's something that you actively have to remind yourself of. I still have to do it all of the time. Um, I am not being unfairly advantaged by working in a way that means I can contribute in the same way that everyone else can. And there's a lot of guilt and a lot of shame and a lot of embarrassment that comes with that. And you have to keep on picking it and keep on picking it and just yeah, it's it's a never ending thing, unfortunately. Uh, but keep hold hold strong in that thought, like when Natalie said, hold strong in it. I was going to say something along those lines, but not as eloquently. So I'm glad you said it. My brain didn't doesn't always come out the way that my brain is saying it. Um, but that's exactly it. It's about being the advocate for yourself, talking about yourself confidently, and talking about what what you need to be an adjustment. And I always think that the term like reasonable adjustments, like who judges what's reasonable? Do you know what I mean? If 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 for me it means I can do my job as well as everyone else, then it's very much reasonable. Um, I always say to people, you know, I can't stand up if we go to an event, but sit me down at a help desk or sit me down. I'll chat to anyone. You know, there's strengths. And there's some people in in a team that you might work in who the last thing they can ever think of, you know, they would hate sitting at a help desk, talking to people or being on the phone or those sorts of things. Play to your strengths, you know, look at look at what your strengths are and, and what you enjoy as well. But, yeah, definitely. I was, I was going to say I am. Um, as I mentioned, I work with students in uh, within the Careers and Employability Service, also work with recent graduates. So for up to three years after graduation, you can still get support from the Careers and Employability Service. I have a, a kind of bank of different letters or emails. Um, if you want to email an employer in advance of an interview, for example, um, I have one that a student wrote initially and I've kind of tweaked um, and, you know, can give it to, to people if they want that to say, If you want to talk about what your disability is, for example, the first letter I had was about autism. The student said, I'm autistic. This is what it means for me. And these are things that I want you to know before the interview. So it's not saying so sorry about my disability. It's saying here's just a bit of, um, you know, advice or here's some information that might be of use to you. This is what I will need for the interview. Um, So if, if anyone is interested in that at all, please do get in touch with me. Um, and I will happily provide that and support anyone in in asking for reasonable adjustments or even just thinking about it. Um, I think that actually kind of moves us quite neatly into the last few minutes that we've got for this discussion, which is kind of about, you know, that 
searching for employers, searching for career paths that really play to your strengths, but also finding an employer um, and that will be able to tailor any requirements that you have to suit your own needs. And what do you look for? Where do you find that information before you've even applied to a company or for, or for a role? I suspect Hannah's going to be the expert on this, but I'd be interested to hear from our recent graduates about how you found that process. I think for me, it wasn't as easy at the start, I think. Um, I think it's definitely something you've had to learn through experiences, some good, amazing experiences, some not. But I think... For me, in terms of that stuff, I will look at, like, rather than saying, yeah, we care about staff well-being, like, what does that actually mean? Like, what stuff are you doing and what actions are you doing? Rather than just saying, I suppose, yeah, we work within line with this policy and this procedure and it's like, okay, but what are you actually doing? So in, like, my current organisation, um, we have so many, like, staff, like, networks and stuff, like, one which is mental health and wellbeing. I don't think I've ever worked in a place that just has that many. I was like, wow, like, I didn't know that this existed and stuff, and one that I co-chair and stuff like that, and they just have a massive focus on, I suppose, like, as a general, the general organisation has a massive focus, like, they started a whole programme on just, like, work, working well and stuff like that, and how to do that and focusing on yourself. Um, Also looking at, I, I think, stuff like staff well-being days and stuff like that or when you're not okay and things like that what processes they do there and you can ask like you can ask these things I think a lot of people when they apply for jobs don't feel like they can ask that or like in an interview or even before like if you have someone's contact and asking what types of things they actually do sometimes I might reach out to people on stuff like LinkedIn who are within a, within a role and as well as asking them questions that I might have about the role but just what's your sense of the organisation like how do you feel and you can be completely honest about that and stuff and that's something I think those things are like yeah very important um for me and especially like going forward as well like things that I definitely will be asking more so I think than I did before and having a space that you feel that you're not judged for whatever you need to say and if you're not okay you feel you can say that rather than oh I feel I have to keep working and I can't say anything because they're gonna think xyz and stuff like that so yeah sort of to add on in this uh to do with covid a good way of like sort of trying to figure out what they're like with anything really just well-being is ask how they did with covid like did they let their people work from home are they still working from home because if they're like oh they came back the moment we could <laughs> mm, don't like that it's a bit yeah. suspect but yeah is covid sort of i'm not saying covid's good it's bad, bad but the silver lining of it is it's way easier for anyone to figure out what's going on in a company now especially because covid is causing some you know disabling uh illnesses after it's gone like a lot of people who had COVID now have POTS, which means they have to be very careful about their movement. And so now they can, without having to worry too much, they can just straight up ask, what have you done for your employees in the past two years? Definitely. I think, um, I don't know about the rest of you, but certainly when COVID hit, it was like, oh, suddenly all these accessibility needs can be met that many of us have been asking for for a long time. And you know so it is that kind of silver lining like you said senior it's like um you know actually there are benefits to this horrific situation that we've all been through um but hopefully it means that employers will learn how you know this we can support disabled staff going forward i remembered what i was going to say it was um a lot of students and graduates say to me oh i don't know if i'm disabled enough to tell the employer i've just got then reel off a list of you know whatever it is and and actually it is about that kind of thinking about it from the perspective of the adjustment what is it that will help you to do your job well it, you don't even have to tell the the employer what your disability is it's about saying this is what I need to be able to bring the level playing field so that I can do my job to the best of my ability and employers want you to use your time wisely to you know do your job well therefore they should be able to put these things in place. Um, and if they ever say that there is a, a financial constraint to it, there is a scheme called Access to Work run by the government who they can um, it, it kind of pay for additional things like software or some people will get kind of travel reimbursement, that sort of thing. So there's options out there. You know, there are kind of options. And, and you mentioned, everyone's mentioned about like um, the kind of social support side of it. So Natalie's saying about the staff um, networks 
within most organisations will have that kind of thing. Um, Becky, going back to what you said about the kind of how do we find those sort of inclusive employers or how do you consider whether an employer might be good, you know, for you or interesting. I always think having a an initial look at their web page, getting a feel for, is this someone who, again, like Natalie said, um, you know, are they just almost ticking a box by saying we comply with this policy or are they talking about we had an amazing volunteering day where we supported this charity and, um, you know, here's some... Um, statistics on the how many disabled staff we have who have done x y and z you know kind of making it part of their their news their kind of their website does their website showcase people that you recognize like people of diverse ages and genders and races and you know anything like that is that something that um or ability you know it, that's something to look for and do they even mention things like diversity equality inclusivity are those kind of words that are used extensively would you be proud to work for them is always a good test you know it's not just about kind of oh I probably should apply to this place because they've got a good job going what's the company like what's the atmosphere you can look on LinkedIn Glassdoor the student room kind of get other people's opinions on on those sorts of things you know what's it really like to work there so um there's lots of tests to, to kind of look at that and and again I do a variety of different talks on these sorts of things if anyone ever wanted to have a chat you know more than more than happy to do that with you and with that I think we're just about out of time um I just want to kind of wrap this up by saying thank you everyone for your generosity with your time and your experiences and your complete willingness to share um, I really hope that the students who, who listen to this get an awful lot out of it. And equally, I hope that you'll be willing to come back again at some point in the future for, for more chats and more podcasts. If there's anything that you wanted to say as kind of a wrap up point, I'll hand it over to you now before we, uh, we, we say goodbye. Um, I've got a very quick thing just as general advice for disability. If you are like convinced that there is a specific thing you have, fight with healthcare. Because when I was young, I was told it was just growing pains and they led me to believe that I was fine. Age 20, I go to a new doctor and they're going, no, that's not normal. And then I spent five years fighting for a diagnosis. So if you think something is wrong, fight for the diagnosis. It's worth it in the long run. I agree. Um, That's a really good thing to, it's that resilience, isn't it? It's kind of keeping on going and you know your own self, you know what's right and what's wrong with your body or with your mind and actually keeping on saying can we can we do something you know can we find another test or um some way of being supported that that can help me um because you do get almost knocked back like you know thyroid issues I'm constantly told oh your numbers are fine you know (laughs) so but I'm freezing all the time. My hair doesn't grow. My nails don't, you know, your body's not regenerating. Um, Oh, well, it's fine. You know, it should be between this and that and yours is whatever. What if my number isn't within that range normally? You know, it's about kind of what are the other things going on? And it is it is exhausting to to be that that person constantly going back and forth. But absolutely, absolutely keep on doing that. And take someone with you if you've got an appointment and you think, like me, my brain just, you know, I lose track of where I'm going because of fatigue. Take notes, take someone with you um, or or, or ask to record things as well so you can understand it and reflect on it fully. That's absolutely fine, just as you would in a lecture, for example. Yeah, I think also to echo on what everyone said, just... Yeah, just stand strong in that, like your disability or however you like to term it is, even that term sometimes can 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 have question marks around it. But I just think, yeah, just stand strong like you are yourself and don't let people make you feel that you're less than it should be. Like I've said, like probably 100 times society that should adapt to you. Um and also at the same time, like as well as saying, yeah, be strong, like it's OK, it's OK to be vulnerable. Like I think I've learned for myself, like times where your disability or impairment might make you feel vulnerable. Um, there is so much strength in that and what I've learned and the connections that I've built 
being vulnerable and things that people have said to me about me sharing my vulnerabilities like with other people yeah I don't those are compliments for life like literally so um yeah you can develop so many connections and I think I've gone on throughout what I've done to be supportive for other people and and to be aware and to create that space that people actually feel comfortable to speak to me so yeah that's what I would say yeah definitely um and just kind of piggybacking on what Natalie said there is that although systems can be set up against disabled people and there is a lot of need for self-advocacy you're not alone and you are coming as part of a community that is in solidarity with you of disability and disabled activists that have been working this doing this work for generations and us as disabled people need to have each other's backs and be there for each other so if you can't find the support that you need in the systems, know that you'll find the solidarity you want in other disabled people and in the community and reach out and get get in touch. And that's the way that's the way it is. Do you know what I mean? Like that's the way we, we help each other and that's the way that it's going to continue to be. So you're never going to be facing an issue completely by yourself, even if it does feel that way sometimes. It's an incredibly strong point to end on. I think so I just want to say again thank you so much for all of your time um really appreciate it and I hope you all have a lovely weekend nearly there <laughs> thanks bye and thanks for inviting us bye thanks everyone so nice much. to see take and hear care. from you all <laughs> take Let's care okay. take bye. care bye. bye bye unfortunately that's all we have time for in this episode of Kent Voices this podcast was brought to you by Student Services at the University of Kent For more information, visit www.kent.ac.uk forward slash student services.